السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه We are continuing today بإذن الله تعالى Coming live to you to continue the halaqat, the study circles that we used to run at Isna We're running them now live, alhamdulillah And we hope inshallah ta'ala that you can join us بإذن الله تعالى So as you know, this is a children's and a youth halaqa So if you have children or youth um, in your family, this is a good opportunity to bring everyone together and to have a beautiful discussion, bidin Allah ta'ala together. Wa alaikum salam, Sister Inaya. May Allah bless you all and give you Jannah al-Firdaus, Ya Rabbi Ameen. So I'm just going to wait a few minutes, bidin Allah ta'ala, to make sure that everyone is here. And in the meantime, instead of just waiting and wasting your time, what we'll do inshallah is we'll open up with a quick recitation of the Quran. So that way, number one, uh, we're all engaged. Uh, two, we all get into a better state of mind and a better state of heart. And that way we're more receptive, inshallah, to the reminder when it comes. Bidnallah ta'ala. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدع اليتيم ولا يحض على طعام المسكين فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون الذين هم يراءون ويمنعون الماعون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها وأخرجت الأرض أثقالها وقال الإنسان ما لها يومئذ تحدث أخبارها بأن ربك أوحى لها يومئذ يصدر الناس أشتاتا ليروا أعمالهم فمن يعمل مثقال ذرة خيرا يره ومن يعمل مثقال ذرة شرا يره بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا مولانا محمد عليه وعلى آله أفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم uh, Thank you for joining us I see some of you here you're commenting May Allah bless you Minal May Allah bless you Mahd uh, may Allah bless you, Inaya. May Allah give you all Jannah al-Firdaus, Ya Rabbi. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. I hope if, if there are children and uh, youth, I hope uh, you're not giving your parents too much of a hard time. This is a time uh, to help out. 
uh, understand that your parents at this time may be feeling uh, a lot of stress, uh, a lot of uncertainty in terms of what's going to happen next. Um, so this is a time in which, inshallah, you can support. It's a time in which you can carry uh, help with carrying the weight, bi'ithnillah ta'ala, and not be a reason for stress, but a source of uh, relief, a source of good for your parents, bi'ithnillah ta'ala. Uh, Rashda is saying, uh, or Minal and Mahad, one of you is saying that it's uh, your birthday. Okay, طيب. Uh, as uh, yani the, the, the main um, opinion on about birthdays, alhamdulillah, or the opinion that I adopt and follow, is that birthdays are just like any other day. Uh, we are grateful for the gift of life. Um, and inshallah, we make dua just like any other day. So I'll make dua for you just like any other day, Rashida, or I believe it's your uh, daughter uh, or son, Minal or Mahad. Which one is it? Minal or Mahad? Whichever, may Allah bless you and give you the best in dunya and akhirah and make you happy, Ya Rabb, in both abodes and give you guidance and give you steadfastness and clarity and give you um, knowledge that benefits you and allow you to benefit others with the knowledge that he's gifted you, Ya Rabb. Ameen. Uh, Muhammad, Umar, and Abdullah, Assalamu alaikum. Are we all here? Inaya says, I believe most of them are here. I can't really see, um, you know, the, the full uh, number, but inshallah khair, that's not relevant. Let's get into the stories. Whoever is here, inshallah, will benefit. Whoever is not can watch it later, bidnillah ta'ala. As you know, these are recorded, bidnillah. But just, yes, Minal. Okay, perfect. May Allah bless you and give you the best in dunya and akhirah. Minal, how old are you now, Minal? How old are you? While we wait for Minal's response, uh, just a reminder, please do share this video, inshallah, so as many of the young brothers and sisters who are at home can benefit, inshallah. So do share, do like, do comment, inshallah, if you see some benefit, bidnillah ta'ala. All right, so let's start, inshallah, with the stories for today. Some of you know we recited at the very beginning uh, three beautiful surahs in the Quran. We recited Surah Al Duha, we recited Surah Al Zalzala, and we recited Surah Al Ma'un. We recited Surah Al Ma'un. And I want to just begin today by reflecting on those surahs for our young children, our young brothers and sisters. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Duha, Alam yajidika yatiman fa'awa. Allah is speaking to the Prophet Muhammad in the surah. And he's asking the Prophet Muhammad a series of questions to get him to think and to reflect and to be grateful about the things that have happened in the past and to be prepared for what is to come tomorrow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Muhammad Did Allah not find you an orphan and give you a home? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not find you looking for guidance, looking for a way to help people around you and gave you a way out? And did he not find you to be poor and Allah gave you wealth? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet Muhammad sallam of three things. Number one, he was alone, he was an orphan, he had no one and Allah gave him a home, gave him a shelter, gave him a refuge. Second, he was poor or second, he was looking for guidance. You know, he's looking around to everyone around him and he's hoping, how can I guide? How can I help my people? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him guidance, gave him a way to help his people. And then the third, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not find you poor and gave you wealth? And this is a reminder for all of us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can really, really bless. And Allah can give us in many unexpected ways, in many beautiful ways. So let's look at those three examples before we jump into the stories. The Prophet Muhammad sallam, as you know, he lost his father very early on. You know, he, he didn't even witness, subhanAllah, you know, his, his, his father. Um, so he was an orphan in that way. And then he lost his mother on the way back from uh, Medina. You know, she was coming back from Medina. And she got sick along the way, right? And she passed away, subhanAllah. She passed away. So he lost his mom and father early on in his life. At six years old, he's a complete orphan. No mom, no dad. And then he's quickly now taken into all these homes, right, of his family who are very powerful. Um, and now he's taken care of by many different people, his grand uncle, his uncle, they're all taking care of him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding him that he was alone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him all of that. So a reminder for all of us who are feeling alone, who are feeling like, you know, we don't have much. We, we, you know, maybe in this time you're feeling very stressed out. You're feeling a little bit uh, worried that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you a way out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you the best of company. And imagine the Prophet Muhammad go, goes from being an orphan to having the best companions, the best friends, 
to having people like Khadija in his life, to having people like Ali and people like Hassan and people like Hussein, it takes a while. But because he's patient and he's disciplined, Allah opens up the doors and give him so many beautiful things, subhanAllah. And that's one of the lessons that we take for today. Don't just worry about today's problems because today's problems might create, inshaAllah, the, 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 the heart that is ready to receive many blessings tomorrow, many gifts tomorrow. So be optimistic always in life and be happy with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you and use it to turn whatever you have into some khair, bi'ithnillah ta'ala, to turn into some khair. طيب. The second thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallam, did I, did Allah not find you? Did Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about himself in the plural, did we, out of respect, yani the plural we, the, the, the honorable we, did we not find you to be poor and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you wealth? And this is very powerful. And this is what I want to start with for today, inshallah, the story for today. Listen to this carefully. When the Prophet Muhammad sallam was alone as an orphan growing up, he took on different jobs at one time. So for example, he was taking care of shepherds. The Prophet Muhammad sallam, he was taking care of sheep. He was a shepherd. And as a shepherd, he really quickly gained a beautiful reputation for being honest. So people started to hire him for other things. And he quickly started to basically do chores and to do business here and there until finally he earned the reputation for being a very honest businessman. So then one of the richest merchants in, 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 in Mecca, Khadija radiallahu anha, who was a woman, and she had a lot of money because her uh, pr previous husband died. So she was a widow and she inherited all of the money of her previous husband. And she had kids from her previous husband, yeah? But she had a lot of money. So she comes and she doesn't approach Muhammad Sallam directly, but she sends one of her workers who's a family member and she tells him, listen, I want you to hire Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is before he's a, he, he's a prophet. I want you to hire Muhammad and I want you to keep a close eye on him. I want to see what people are saying about him, like how honest and trustworthy is all of that true? Or is it just a, a facade? Is it just a thing that he pretends and he just puts on in front of people to, uh, you know, achieve a certain goal? You know, sometimes people will look very nice and kind, but deep inside they're not nice and kind. They're just putting that on as a show. So may Allah make it sincere. That's one of the du'as that we make at this time. So she hires him uh, indirectly through that family member and she tells the family member, keep an eye on him. So this family member goes with the Prophet Muhammad Sallam from Mecca to Sham. He travels with him for such a long time. And during the whole time that he's with him, he's looking and he's watching and he falls in love with him. He's, he comes back to Khadija and he says, everywhere we go, people rush towards him. He's so kind, he's so nice. Even with business, he would sell something and he would sell it for much more than what it's worth because people are happy to give him and he wouldn't haggle, he wouldn't you know, force. You know, some businessmen, they'll squeeze you out of every penny. Some businesswomen, they'll make your life miserable. Yeah, but he wasn't like that very natural it flows it's beautiful and he goes on and he tells her not only that but also during the time that I've, I've, I've been with him so many blessings were happening you know he reports for example that a cloud would be coming to shelter him and things like that tamam that really made him uh, uh really respect and admire muhammad so then khadija after do, doing her homework she consults a few other people and finally she decides you know what she's going to send a marriage proposal Muhammad Sallam at this time is 25 years old and she is at this time 40 years old, which means there's a 15 year difference. Although some other narrations say that she was younger, but the stronger narration says that she was 15 years older than him. Now imagine this, and here's where I want us to reflect, subhanAllah. Khadija radiallahu anha, when she sends that marriage proposal through another individual, um, when Muhammad Sallam reaches, the, the news reaches him, he doesn't jump and he's okay, fine, yes, let's do it. He actually says, let me consult my family. And here I want to ask you a question. Imagine that you're a little older, you're 18, you're 25. Imagine you're ready for marriage. And someone comes to you who's rich, who's wealthy, who's beautiful, who's got an amazing amount of resources that will help you in many different ways. Yeah, And has a great reputation, great family, all of that. Rich, wealthy, mashallah, fits every category. And that person wants to marry you. Wouldn't you be like, Allahu Akbar, yes, let's do it tonight. That's not what Rasulullah does. What does he do? He says, let me consult my family. And that shows even though he's an independent man who can make those decisions by himself, he wants to make sure that his family is okay with it. He wants to consult. He wants to do his tishara. And that's one thing that we have to remember, my brothers and sisters, my young brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter how independent, how strong you are, how great you are. Always consult your family. Always keep your family in the loop. Because your mom, your dad were in your life for years before anyone else comes in. How long have you known your friends? Five years? 
Well, how long have you known your uh, parents? How long have your parents been there? Who's done more for you than your own parents, right? So keep your parents in the loop. Keep, keep your family in the loop. What they have to offer in terms of their perspective, in terms of their advice is very important. And we shouldn't make those decisions by ourselves, inshallah. Tamam? So remember that. In addition to that, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, you know, uh, after consulting with his family, they tell him, don't hesitate, get married, bismillah. And they throw this beautiful, um, you know, wedding in which a hundred camels are served as food for everyone who comes. And it becomes known as one of the most beautiful weddings in the city of Mecca at the time. And this is before the Prophet Muhammad Sallam is initiated into prophethood, before he's a prophet uh, speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being spoken to uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibreel alayhi salam. Now what's really unique, what's really unique is Khadija comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and she says to him after being married to him, after knowing him more than anyone else, and she says, my money is yours, my business is yours. I know you'll be able to do more with it than I would have done myself. She gives all of her possessions to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And overnight, Rasulullah sallallahu goes from being an average person with just a good amount of wealth, like anyone else, to be one of the richest people in the entire city of Mecca. Entire city of Mecca. And isn't that, isn't that incredible, subhanAllah? How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can turn Rasulullah sallallahu fate from being just an average person with just a decent amount of wealth to being one of the richest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just like that. And there's so many reflections here. Remember in Mecca, it's a city that buries women alive, buries girls alive. So this is a woman who's made a name for herself, made a reputation for herself. And now she has so much money. The last thing she's going to do is just give it to some random guy like that. So imagine how much she trusts Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa before she's able to give everything that she has, give her heart and her possessions to him, willingly, voluntarily and allow him to basically run the business. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallam thrives and does well with that. And the money grows. And now that he has a lot of time because he's got the money, his business is flowing, everything is doing well. He has a lot of time. So what does he do with that time? Imagine overnight, and I want to hear your answers, yeah? Overnight, imagine that you go from being a poor person to being one of the richest, mashallah tabarakallah, in the entire city. You go from being a poor person to be one of the richest women or men in the whole city. What would you do with that money? Let me hear you. How many of you would buy video games? Let's buy video games. Let's smash Allah. How many of you would uh, say, you know what? I'm going to buy a Ferrari. How many of you say, I'm going to buy a Lambo? How many of you would say, I'm going to buy a house? What would you do with all that money? Let me hear your comments, inshallah ta'ala. For those of you who are asking what days of the halaqa, the days of the halaqa are Tuesday and Thursday at 5 p.m. Wa alaykum salam, brother Tariq. 10, 10, Minal. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah. Welcome, Minal. Salam alaikum, Mu'ad. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah for those. Salam alaikum, Sara. May Allah bless you, Sara. 10 years old. MashaAllah. Excellent. Excellent, Mu'ad. Who was the Prophet Muhammad Sallam's worst enemy? Uh, Abu Jahl in Mecca and Abdullah ibn Ubayd ibn Salul in Medina and a few other people as well. I turned 11 yesterday. Congratulations. Hassan, salam alaikum. Hello. Salam alaikum. Ah, someone already answered, MashaAllah, Abu Jahl. Good, good, good. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. I, you're, you're bored at home alone, I can imagine. Yes, he never sold overpriced, and that's why people loved him. Ahsent, ahsent, mashallah, tabarakallah. You would give poor, you would give the people money, mashallah. Aisha Samak, this is, I believe, uh, your son, mashallah, tabarakallah. Give poor people in share, buy a house, and give poor people, mashallah. Wa alaikum salam, Zaki. Excellent. So, some of you with all that money would buy houses and all. Guess what the Prophet Muhammad did with all that money that he had? He started taking care of the orphans. He started taking care of the poor people in the city. And in addition to that, he started taking some time away from the busy lifestyle and retreating to uh, a cave. So he would go to the cave, Ghar Hira, and he would sit there by himself, away from people. And he would just reflect and make dua. Ya Allah, give me the ability to help my people. He's looking at his people. He's seen that they're doing so many terrible things. They're not honest. Some of them, some of them just think about the tribe. The tribe is everything. Forget Allah. The tribe comes first before Allah. Some of them don't really care about subhanAllah, the slaves. They're you know hurting the slaves and mistreating the slaves for their own gain. So he turns to this cave and he's in the cave alone. Because you know, when you're around people, there's so many distractions. He turns alone by himself and he starts making dua to Allah. Ya Allah, 
help me find a way to help my people. Help me find a way to serve my people. And he makes dua over and over again. He doesn't give up once. He doesn't just say, I'm going to do this for a day or two. He does this for months. Months. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah al-Firdaus. Excellent, Yahya. Excellent, excellent. May Allah bless you, Suhail. May Allah bless you, Luqman. And give you Jannah al-Firdaus. I see all of your comments. So he doesn't do any of that. What does he do instead? What does he do instead? He makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help guiding his people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initiates him into prophethood through Jibreel alayhi salam who comes and says, Iqra, 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 as we know the story. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him prophethood. He was an orphan and Allah gave him family and company. He was poor and Allah gave him wealth. He was looking for a way to help his people and Allah gave him the gift of Islam so that he can help the people around him. And that's one of the lessons that we take from tonight. Number one, take advantage of the quiet time. This is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're at home by yourself. You're most of like you're spending most of the day at home. Get up at night when no one else is looking between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray and make dua to Allah. Ya Allah, help me, guide me. Ya Allah, I'm looking for truth. Give it to me. Ya Allah, I'm looking for strength. Give it to me. Ya Allah, I'm looking for guidance. Give it to me. Ya Allah, I'm looking for knowledge that benefits. Give it to me. Ya Allah, I'm looking for happiness that is pleasing to you. Give it to me. Ya Allah, I'm looking for better friends. Ya Allah, I'm looking to be a better person. Ya Allah, I'm looking to give up this bad habit. Ya Allah, I'm looking to read. Yes, to read, to learn, to grow. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give all of that to me. Before you go to sleep, read Surah Al-Mulk. Read the du'as. Read the adhkar. This is an opportunity to learn, to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to grow. And two, inshallah, uh, become better in other ways. But otherwise, you wouldn't have had the time. So don't look at this as time to be bored. Don't just sit home and start peeling potatoes, as some as the Egyptians say, yeah. Or don't don't start, you know, don't don't be at home and look for ways to make trouble, yeah. Start pranking people. No, don't do that. Use your time productively. Yeah, this is time for you to cleanse your heart, to cleanse your heart, right? So take this as an opportunity to step back and to ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for guidance and to make lots of du'a. Tamam. And I'll make a deal. I'll make a deal with you, inshallah ta'ala. We're going to be getting Zoom soon, which means I'll be able to interact with you and I'll be able to listen to your responses. I'll be able to watch you on camera. So, what I want you to do in the meantime, bidnillah ta'ala, is start thinking of all the du'as. Start thinking of all the du'as that you want to make and start learning them. Tamam? So, ask your parents, mom, what's the best du'a to make when I want knowledge? Mom, what's the best du'a to make when I uh, you know, leave the house? What's the best du'a to make when I enter the market? What's the best du'a to make when I when I enter the house? What's the best du'a to make when I want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, istikhara, like asking him to help me with making a decision? And learn all those du'as, yeah? And inshallah, when we go on Zoom, I want to listen to your du'as. I want to see how you're pronouncing them. And then inshallah, we can learn more of these du'as, bidnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, together. Tayyib. So this is again reflecting on Surah Al-Duha. Reflecting on Surah Al-Zalzala. إِذَا زُلْزِلَةِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَةِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا يَوْمَئِذٍ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا بِأَنَّ رَبَّكَ أَوْحَى لَهَا يَوْمَئِذٍ يَصْدُرُ النَّاسُ أَشْتَاتًا لِيُرَوْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ Beautiful. Allah says, whoever does an atom's worth, an atom's weight of good will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of bad shall see it as well. Which means any little good thing that I do, Allah will allow me to see the impact in this dunya and in the akhirah. Any little sin that I do, unless Allah forgives me and pardons me for it with his afu and maghfirah, then I'm going to also see the impact of it. So what we learn from that is don't underestimate the smallest of deeds and don't underestimate the smallest of sins. A small sin is big because it's the one that you're committing it against. And a small deed is great because Allah is so forgiving, so merciful, and so uh, generous in the rewarding. So don't say, oh, it's a small thing. You know, the poem, The poem. there's a very beautiful poem. And the poem says, uh, Avoid sins whether small or big, that is taqwa, that is true love for Allah, true protection that you seek from Allah. That is you being honest in honoring the boundaries that Allah has set. So avoid sins whether small or large, that is taqwa. Wasna and live your life kamashin as someone who walks ardi shawki, as someone who's walking over spiky paths. Careful where you step. Imagine the spikes on the ground. Are you going to be like, woohoo, let's run around? You wouldn't do that. You'd be very careful. So, 
واصنع كماش فوق ارض الشوك يحذر ما يرى learn and walk and work in this world as though you're you're walking on a very spiky thorny path careful where you step لا تحقرن صغيرة don't underestimate the small sin ان الجبال من الحصى for the biggest mountains are made from little pebbles it starts off with small sins and then before you know it those small sins grow into bigger sins may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us طيب um lots of reflections alhamdulillah from the quran now let's jump into some stories inshallah bidn allah ta'ala when the prophet muhammad sallam left from mecca to medina he had to leave very quietly very discreetly because people were waiting outside to kill whoever is in the bed of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet muhammad sallam was so honest that people kept stuff in his house when people came to mecca to buy and sell because it's a big city big market people came to buy and sell and sometimes there would be so many great deals during hajj which is the one time in the year in which everyone would come together everyone would come together and buy so much stuff and they would have too much and they wouldn't be able to take it back home they wouldn't have enough camels enough horses to transport all of it back in their caravans so sometimes they would look around and they would say oh oh i bought too much stuff now during this hajj season what do i do is there anyone here who's honest trustworthy that i can leave my stuff with and they would tell them the people of mecca would say to that person who's looking for a place like a bank is before banks existed yeah you look for a place and they say go to muhammad's house Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala Muhammad. Go to Muhammad's house, because this is before he's a prophet. Yes, so they just say, go to Muhammad's house. Go to Muhammad ibn Abdullah's house. He's an honest man. He will leave your stuff there with him, and you'll come back and pick it up next year. Does that make sense? So people would come from all over the peninsula and leave their stuff in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa home. And when they would leave it in his home, he would take care of it. And they would come back the next year to get it. That's how honest he was. And he wouldn't look through, he wouldn't do any of that. How many of you, let me ask you this now, how many of you, don't need, you don't need to answer publicly, just think about it privately. How many of you are honest enough that if someone leaves something in your house, you wouldn't even look through it? And how many of you are honest enough that people can leave their belongings with you, knowing that they can come back 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, and it would still be there? That's the level of integrity and honesty that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had. And that's why people trusted him, people trusted everything that he said, and people trusted all of the claims that he's made. Tamam? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be like the Prophet Muhammad sallam in as many ways as possible. So Shamila is saying, not me. I'm not like that. At least you're being honest. Alhamdulillah. Jalil is saying, me. Okay, mashallah Jalil. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I know Yahya is saying, me too. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Uh, uh, Aisha's, uh, what's your name? Uh, Sister Aisha's son. What's your name? I forgot your name. Is it? Uh, Adam is saying, yes, me too. Who, what's your name, uh, Sister Aisha's son? I'll come back to you in a second, inshallah. Tamam? So the Prophet Muhammad sallam, now that he's leaving from Mecca to Medina, he has to leave discreetly because people are outside trying to kill him. Subhanallah, trying to hurt him. Trying to hurt him. So he's leaving discreetly. But is he going to just leave all the stuff in his house that belongs to people that are trying to hurt him? Is he going to leave it or take, it, take, them, take the stuff with him? And now let me ask you this. Let me put this in perspective, yeah? Imagine this. Um, imagine this, uh, let's see, Adam, or Yahya, or Jalil, or um, Aisha, or Muhammad, or Ahmed, all of you guys who are watching, Zara, all of you who are listening, imagine this, imagine someone comes to you and says, here, hold on to my iPad, and then that same person leaves and starts saying bad things about you, starts hurting you, starts saying bad things about your family, starts breaking your stuff, starts stealing your stuff, and then goes as far as trying to kill you. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. May Allah protect you. Hassan. Yes, Hassan. Tamam. Imagine this happening to you, Hassan. You're so nice to this person. They gave you their stuff, an iPad, and now they're saying all these bad things about you and they're trying to hurt you. How many of you would take the iPad and be like, let you, psh, break it, khalas. How dare you say these bad things about me? Well, let me show you. Through her, you know, khalas, I'm going to destroy your iPad. How many of you would not destroy the iPad? But like, I'm not going to destroy it. I'll just take it. You were rude to me. You broke my stuff. I'll just hold on to your iPad. And how many of you would say, it doesn't matter that you broke my stuff. It doesn't matter that you hurt me. It doesn't matter. He said all those bad things about me. I'm not going to treat you like you've treated me. I'm going to treat you like the way Allah tells me to treat you. And then you would start giving them the stuff back. You would give them the iPad back. How many of you would give them the iPad back? MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Some of you are saying. And some are like, what? Give them the iPad back? No. 
steal even more stuff from them. We don't do that as Muslims, yeah? Excellent. So, uh, uh, mashallah, I'm, I'm assuming that's uh, one of the two, one of the two uh, brothers and sisters, mashallah, are saying in the chat that you would definitely give it back. Mashallah, that's good. And that's what the Prophet Muhammad Sallam did. Okay, one of you saying, I'm sorry, but I would be mad. That's good. At least you're being honest. Hassan is saying, I would as well. Good. You're being honest, yeah? Alhamdulillah. And you're saying you're, you'll be you'll be mad, you'll be hurt, but you'd still try to forgive, which is good. I like that. I really respect that. You're being honest with yourself. That's good, alhamdulillah, yeah? And some of us w w would like to say, oh, you know what? I would definitely give it back. But when it's time, you feel the emotions and it's too much and you wouldn't actually be able to forgive. But Rasulullah sallallahu told Ali ibn Abi Talib, stay in my bed. And when, I'm let, when I've gone to Medina, then return all the stuff back to the people. So imagine... The Prophet Muhammad Sallam asked Ali ibn Abi Talib to return all the stuff back to the people that are trying to hurt him. So Ali ibn Abi Talib eventually stayed a couple of days behind and he returned all the stuff. Even though there were people outside waiting to kill whoever is in that bed. Now years later when Ali eventually came to Medina and the Prophet Sallam passed away and Abu Bakr became the Khalifa and Umar became the Khalifa. Years later, years later, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam's companions asked Ali ibn Abi Talib. They said, hey Ali. He was a, an older person at this time, an old man, older man, uh, one of the companions, senior companions. And they asked him, Oh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, how did he sleep that night in the bed of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, knowing that there are people outside waiting to hurt whoever's in that bed? How were you able to sleep? How were you able to sleep in that bed? So he said, I slept like a baby. I had one of the best sleeps of my life. And they're like, huh? You slept like a baby? There were people outside waiting to hurt whoever's in that bed and you slept like a baby? How did you sleep like a baby? He says, well, because the Prophet Muhammad looked at me and he said, Ali, sleep well, sleep comfortably. Nothing bad will happen to you tonight. He said, the Prophet gave me, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Muhammad. He gave me his promise that nothing bad will happen to you. Now, how many of us go to sleep and we get that assurance? We get someone coming to us and saying, hey, don't worry. You're going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. You're going to wake up tomorrow. Do you guys have anyone telling you, giving you a promise that you're going to wake up tomorrow? We don't know if we're going to wake up tomorrow. We don't know that. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallam assured Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, no other day did someone tell me, like the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, someone that I trusted, that I would wake up. And here the Prophet Sallam is telling me everything's going to be fine. So I slept like a baby. And that shows you the word of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam for these companions was so important. They didn't question it. If he said something, they would believe it. That's how much love they had for him. Let me ask you this. Two questions. One, when the Prophet Muhammad says something, do you believe it? And two, when you say something, is it honest? Is it true to the point where if you say it, no one would question it? No one would ask any questions. As soon as you say it, I believe it. How many of you, when you say something, your friends are like, well... You know, I know they said it, but they have a habit of twisting the truth and exaggerating. Yeah. I know some of you guys, I've seen it in the halaqas. Yeah. You will come up with the strangest story to make people laugh. Yeah? We don't do that as Muslims. We are honest as much as possible with our words. Yeah. We try to be honest. We try to be true. MashaAllah, good Hassan. May Allah bless you. Excellent. Jaleel, Barakallah Fikum. And all of you, may Allah bless you and give you Jannah. Excellent. Uh, Ziba Zaid and Muhammad, may Allah bless you and give you Jannah al-Firdaus, Ya Rabbi Ameen. Thank you for joining us. Barakallah fikum, may Allah reward you and give you Jannah al-Firdaus. As soon as we get Zoom, I'll be getting the opportunity to inshallah watch you and interact with you. Uh, we have Zoom, alhamdulillah, but as soon as we uh, start using it, inshallah. So uh, start getting ready, your cameras and your mics ready, inshallah, because we're going to be seeing you soon, bidin Allah ta'ala. Barakallah fikum. Excellent, may Allah reward you and give you Jannah al-Firdaus, Ya Rabbi. Excellent, I see your comments, yes, pray five times a day. Tamam. So that's how much the word of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam meant to the companions. And that's how much the Prophet Muhammad Sallam's uh, companions trusted him. Trusted him. And I give you another example. I give you another example. Good, Rashda, that you don't twist the truth, mashallah. And you're, you're, mashallah, tabarakallah. Let me give you another example. The Prophet Muhammad Sallam, Prophet Muhammad Sallam, when he went to Isra and Mi'raj, when he went for the journey of ascension, the people, when they heard this, they came to Abu Bakr, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam's best friend. And he said to him, hey, your friend Muhammad is claiming that he traveled to the heaven and back in one night. And he stopped along the way in Jerusalem. Wow, wonderful. Do you believe that? Or do you think your, your, your friend Muhammad is losing his mind? 
So Abu Bakr said, if Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it, I believe it without doubt. If he said it, I believe it happened without any doubt. You know, don't assume that these companions were, you know, they, they didn't have a brain. They were just believing whatever they heard. No, they were critical. They were very smart. They asked questions. They were very logical. They were very critical. But because they had so much trust in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu based on the way that he walked and the way that he talked and the way that he carried himself, they loved him. And they trusted him. They trusted him. Taha, Muhib, Madiha, and, and Samra. Welcome, welcome. May Allah bless you. And give you Jannah al-Firdaus, Ya Rabb. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Jazakum Allah khair. And Jannah and, and Hassan, may Allah bless you all. And give you Jannah al-Firdaus, Ya Rabb. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Excellent. Tamam? So one of the lessons that we take from tonight, make sure that your word has value. Your word is important. Your word is trusted. Tamam? We'll take that, inshallah. And now let's look at another story for tonight. Because this is story time for children. So for those of you who are a little older, I appreciate you tuning in, but we have more uh, mature content, inshallah, for you later. This is, again, a more interactive, fun story time for children and for the youth, bidn Allah ta'ala. طيب. Our next story, bidn Allah ta'ala, for tonight is a beautiful story. And this beautiful story, bidn Allah ta'ala, involves a situation that happened in Mecca. So I'm going to mention two things. The story of the Adhan and the story of the keys of the Kaaba. The story of the Adhan and the stories of the key to the Kaaba. All right? I want you to remember the names carefully because the next time, inshallah, we meet, whoever reminds me and tells me, Sheikh, I remember the last time you shared these stories. I remember them. Inshallah, once this whole corona thing gets out of, uh, inshallah, the way and we're able to meet back in the masjid, we will, inshallah, be giving you candy for all of those of you who were, uh, you know, com committed and consistent and listening. Alhamdulillah. This is my right hand in case the camera is reversed. Alhamdulillah. How many of you know the sunnah of drinking, by the way? We drink from our right hand and we drink with three sips and we say Bismillah before we drink. Alhamdulillah, after we drink, Bismillah in the name of Allah. And Alhamdulillah, all praise and gratitude belongs to Allah. Excellent. So the Prophet Muhammad, when he went back to Mecca, you know, imagine he left Mecca and so many terrible things people of Mecca were doing. He left to Mecca, started a new community in Medina, and now he went back to Mecca finally to enter Mecca as. A one, as a person who's going to lead Mecca now. He's going to be the leader of Mecca. Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that power and gave him that victory. So what does the Prophet Muhammad sallam do when he comes to Mecca? He tells Bilal, Bilal, get on top of the Kaaba and make adhan. So Bilal gets on top of the Kaaba and he starts to do adhan. Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar And he does the adhan. And I want you to imagine how powerful this image is. Just a few years ago, Bilal was on the ground being beat by his master. He was beating him because he became a Muslim. Bilal was a slave. So when he became a Muslim, his master, Umayy ibn Khalaf, wanted to teach him an ex a lesson. Don't become Muslim. You don't have the right to become Muslim. Tough, tough, tough. He was so rude to him. So Bilal was on the ground with a, with a rock on top of his chest. He couldn't breathe. And he said, Ahad, Ahad, Ahad. One and only one, one and only one. He's asking Allah for help. He's turning to Allah in that moment of weakness. Ya Allah, help me. Ya Allah, help me. He's making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He couldn't say much else because he didn't have energy. He just say one word. Ahad, ahad, ahad. Which means one and only one. Allah is one and only one. طيب. Now years later, Bilal is on top of the Kaaba. The most sacred structure made out of rocks. Look at the way life changes. Before, years ago, he was on the ground with a big rock on top of him, hurting him. And now he's standing on the most sacred structure made out of rocks. And what is he doing? Before, when he was being hurt, he was saying, Ahad, Ahad, Allah, one and only one. And now he's calling on to Allah by calling people to the masjid to pray, becoming the mu'adhin, becoming the person who calls to prayer. And we learn another lesson from that. When you're patient during times of difficulty, and you say, turn, you turn to Allah and only Allah in that moment of difficulty, Allah can allow you to become a source that others turn to for support and others turn to to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you're patient in difficult times and you turn to Allah and Allah alone, Allah can make you a leader for other people. We made them into imams, leaders, guiding with the truth and the command of Allah 
when they were patient. So be patient and remember to guide, uh, remember to, to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those moments of difficulty, Allah will guide you. طيب. So Bilal is making the adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and he's enjoying and the adhan is beautiful. And everyone is like, so it's such a beautiful moment. Everyone's like, Allahu Akbar, Mecca is finally Muslim. And there were three young people, three children, three children, tamam? Allah bless you and give you Jannah al-Firdaw, say, Rabbi, Ameen, tamam. Uh, Sister Shabina, if you have uh, specific questions, let me know, inshallah, and we can uh, address them. طيب. So the Prophet Muhammad sallam, as he tells Bilal to make the adhan, there are three young people in the audience, a little bit to the corner, watching Bilal make the adhan, and they're laughing, and they're mocking the adhan. So imagine Bilal is saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and they're like, no, no, no. So they're mocking the adhan. And of course, it's not befitting for us to mock the adhan because we are Muslims, but they were not Muslim at the time. Those three children were Arab. They were from the Quraysh. They were not Muslim. So the companions come to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they say, Ya Rasulullah, there are three young people, children, teenagers, making fun of the adhan. What should we do? Should we hurt them? Should we discipline? What should we do? Should we bring them to you? You deal with them. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu doesn't say bring them to me. He says, take me to them. And he goes. And he sits with them and he's so nice with them. He says, I heard you guys, you know, you, you're, you're saying something about the Adhan. He's like, no, 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 we didn't say anything about the Adhan. So they deny because they don't want to get in trouble. But he says, let me hear you. And eventually he hears one of them and his voice is very beautiful. His name is Abi Mahdura. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallam sits with him, teaches him about Islam. He's so kind with him. He's so gentle with him, teaches him about Islam. And that boy, that young man, he was, you know, 17 years old at that time. He loves Islam, he loves Rasulullah and the way that Rasulullah treated him and the way that he carried himself, that he became a Muslim. And the Prophet Muhammad assigned him to be the official Mu'addin for Mecca when he was only 17 years old. Which shows you the Prophet Muhammad empowered people from a young age, gave people opportunities from a very young age. May Allah bless you. So don't look at yourself like, I'm so little, I can't do much. No, you're, you're, you're strong, you can do a lot. Yeah, you're not just, don't look at your age as a as a reason why you shouldn't do things. No, grow, be mature, right? You know, subhanAllah, Usama ibn Zayd led the army at 17. And we know that Zainab bint Ali ibn Abi Talib, when she was 11 years old, she turned to her dad and said, Dad, I want to be, I want to be, um, I want to be able to create a place where people come who are homeless and people come who don't have food and then they eat in this place. So Ali ibn Abi Talib helped her make her dream come true. And she opened the first uh, you know, soup kitchen in Islam. And she was only 11 years old. And then she eventually built, subhanAllah, with her father's help, she built, mashallah tabarakallah, a senior's home. So the first soup kitchen and the first senior's home, like large scale, in Medina were built by or initiated by where the idea came from, a young girl, Zainab, who was only 11 years old. So don't sit there and be like, I'm just little, I'm 11, I can't do anything. No, come up with ideas, brainstorm ideas, tell your parents. You know, and if your parents are not able to help, I'm sure they're going to do their best, but come to the masjid, say, have this idea, can we do it, inshallah. And you know what? If we have and we, we have the resources and we're able to, inshallah, we'll make it happen. So always be creative, yeah? You're young, which is good. We have a lot of energy, but it doesn't mean you don't get the opportunities. No, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam gave young people opportunities from an early age. So when, when you walk into the masjid, when you come into the masjid and you're a young person, don't look at yourself as little. You know, sometimes I see young kids, they don't come and they don't say they, they, they don't say salam. They expect that I'm too young to say salam. No, come into the masjid and say salam to people. You know, one of my favorite kids, subhanAllah, he comes into the masjid and everyone he sees, salam alaikum, salam alaikum, salam alaikum. Yeah, before the corona, yeah. Tamam? He comes and he says salam to everyone. He speaks with the adults like he's mashallah tabarakallah. He's you know 11 years old, but he carries himself like he's you know 25, mashallah. So remember to carry yourself with confidence, with humility, and to always be ready to share your ideas. The Prophet Muhammad Sallam, he used to allow the smart kids, mature kids, to sit in his halaqa and learn. And the older companions would say, Ya Rasulullah, aren't they too little? And he would say, no, let them sit. Because they're smart. So if you're not being silly, you're going to be given the opportunity. But don't come in and be silly and do silly things and expect to be sitting in those important gatherings. No. Be mature. Carry yourself with maturity. And inshallah, you'll see that you'll be given those opportunities. Inshallah ta'ala. Excellent. 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 Tayyip. Now, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam assigned Abi Mahdura as the official Mu'addin of Mecca at 16 or 17 years of age. And Bilal eventually went back to Medina and he stayed as the official Mu'addin there. So imagine the official mu'addin of Mecca was a 17-year-old young man, right? So what do you want your legacy to be at a young age, 
right? Don't wait, don't think I'm gonna start achieving my dreams when I'm older. No, start dreaming now about you know dreams that you're gonna inshallah achieve and things that you're gonna be achieving for the ummah at a very young age. Bidna Allah Taala. May Allah bless you and give you jannah for those. Ya Rabb, Amin, Amin, Amin. Excellent, excellent, excellent. طيب. Um, yes, Abu Bakr bought Bilal. Yes, Ahsant, Ahsant. This is Lamia. Excellent, excellent. Wa alaikum salam, brother Islam. Uh, first advice, advice with Husna. Jazakumullah khair, brother Islam. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah al-Firdaus. Uh, Shamila, may Allah bless Shama, Shamaila. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah al-Firdaus. Yes, those are a lot of words that you've typed, mashallah. I'm assuming someone is just sitting there on the keyboard, typing very quickly. Type. At this time, inshallah, let's open up the floor for questions and answers because we've been talking now for 45 minutes. Let's open up the floor for questions and answers. If you have them, inshallah, we'll take them at this time. If not, we can, inshallah, say one or two more stories and then we'll bring the halaqa to an end, inshallah. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Ta'ala. I am waiting for your comments or your questions. Ta'ala. May Allah reward you and give you Jannah al Mustafa, Assalamu Alaikum. How are you, Mustafa? You're very late, or have you been here this whole time? Excellent, Mustafa. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah al Ya Rabbi. Ameen. Tayyip. Questions, inshallah. This is the perfect time to ask questions. Islam Nabil is enjoying, mashallah, tabarakallah. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah Firdaus. Brother Islam, I'm assuming your kids are enjoying, yeah? May Allah bless you and give you Jannah Firdaus. Tayyip, while you ask questions, I'll share with you, inshallah ta'ala. Oh, Zina, yes, Zina. Assalamu alaikum, Zina. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah Firdaus. Excellent. So while we wait, inshallah, for your questions, um, how will you share the Zoom link with us? Uh, we will, inshallah, post it on the on the Facebook page. So inshallah, you have plenty of time. And by the way, for those of you who want to join us tonight at 9 p.m., we will be going live from the masjid to do a few recitations, Sheikh Abdul Aziz and I. So we'll do a recitation of the Quran. If you wanna, inshallah, as you're getting ready to go to sleep, you can put it on and put it to the side and then listen along. So inshallah, you can get that opportunity to connect with the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you go to bed. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Are we supposed to stay inside and not go to the masjid? Yes, we're supposed to stay inside and not go to the masjid because this is a time, inshallah, of uh, social quarantine or basically social distancing. We want to make sure that we are keeping distance from other people to protect others from getting, inshallah, the disease and to protect ourselves as well, inshallah. Ta what happened to, te to the teenager's parents? Oh, the teenager's parents. That's what you're asking about. The teenager's parents weren't there. These teenagers were just by themselves. You know what happens when teenagers are by themselves? Sometimes, yeah, excuse me, <clears throat> sometimes they have a little too much fun when their parents are not around. So that's what was happening, subhanAllah. And the Prophet Muhammad did not hurt them. He did not uh, discipline them in a negative way. He was very kind to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be like him, Ya Rabb. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Tayyip, I'll share with you, inshallah ta'ala, one final story, inshallah ta'ala, for tonight, talking about empowerment, empowerment. And this story, we're going to move a little bit from the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's time, and we're going to come to the time of Abu Hanifa, radiallahu anhu. Imam Abu Hanifa, he was a very smart and a very... A beautiful and a very kind imam and he was also known for his hikmah his wisdom and he was also known for the way that he dealt with people in a very positive and a beautiful way so imam abu hanifa one day he's sitting and he's teaching and this young boy walks in and this young boy walks in and he looks very dedicated he sits down and he's taking notes and he's really really uh focused and he's really really engaged so abu hanifa keeps a close eye on him and every day that he comes abu hanifa keeps an eye on him until one day the boy didn't come anymore so Abu Hanifa starts looking around. What happened to him? Where is he going? Where, where did he go? And he asked people, what happened to him? And they tell him his name is Abu Yusuf and he didn't come because his father is struggling. His father is poor and he's not able to afford to send Abu Yusuf to the halaqa, to the circle, to study. And he wants Abu Yusuf to stay in the fish market to buy fish, uh, to, to, to fish and then to sell the fish to make money for the family. So mm -hmm. Abu, Yusuf, Abu, Abu Hanifa, the sheikh, he was like, oh man, subhanAllah, this young boy, he has so much potential, he's so smart. But if he has to go and sell fish, he's not going to be learning. So he decides to go to the boy's father, to say to the boy's father, how much does your son make when he does, uh, you know, sell, when he sells the fish? And his father tells him, well, he makes like a few dinars, a few, uh, you know, uh, coins. And then Abu Hanifa says, I'll pay him whatever he's making. If he comes to my halaq and if he sits and he learns. And then the father's like, why are you going to waste your money, man? Just let him go and work. What's he going to do with all this knowledge? And then Abu Hanifa told him, one day, if your boy uses, your young son, if he uses his intellect, and we, if we invest in him from this young age, 
One day he might be sitting with the leaders, he might be sitting with the kings, he might be sitting with the umara, he might be sitting with the princes, and he might be so smart that he becomes the official consultant. Subhanallah. He might become the official consultant. Allah yabarik fi malik wa izil jannah ya rab ameen. May Allah give you jannah to firdaus malik as well ya rab ameen. Uh, and Amjad, may Allah bless you and give you jannah to firdaus. Uh, we miss you so much. How do we deal with that? Allah yabarik fi uh, may Allah bless you Amjad and give you jannah to firdaus. We will inshallah be coming to you and spending as much time as possible with you inshallah after this whole uh, you know situation uh, stops inshallah. Barakallah fikum. I'll come back to the question about Wallahi. So let me finish. So the Imam Abu Hanifa says to the father, let me be the one that takes care of him. I'll pay him to attend my halaqa. And one day he might be with the Umara and the princes because of the knowledge that Allah gives him. And it turns out, subhanAllah, that Abu Yusuf blessed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with so much knowledge. And what Abu Hanifa said about him came true. He became one of the greatest sources of knowledge throughout Islamic history because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him and because he was invested in from a young age. So a reminder, even at a young age, don't stop yourself. Don't waste your time with things that are not as important. Dedicate yourself dedicate yourself to knowledge and to learning and to growing. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you if you're able to commit your time and to commit your energy with sincerity and with ihsan. All right. Tayyib. Wallahi is a big word with a lot of weight behind it. What kind of situation come up where uh, it's appropriate to use? I see many people overusing it, so I'm not sure. The Muslim's word by itself is sufficient. There's no need for wallahi. But it's again, it's in a situation where someone is uh, in, in, in questioning what you're saying, is in doubt about what you're saying. You use it with caution. But like he said, may Allah bless you. Don't overuse it. And I ask Allah to forgive me and to forgive us if we overuse it, inshallah ta'ala. Why would Allah make something that kill millions? Why would Allah make something that kills millions? That is a very good question. May Allah bless you and give you jannah for those. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is... Uh, the most wise and he is the most kind uh, We have to remember those two things. He's the most wise and he's the most kind uh, Alhamdulillah the corona has not killed millions of people has not killed millions of people uh, But there are other things that have killed millions of people. So the question is why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow something like that to happen? Tayyip? And there are a few reasons for reflection, you know Subhanallah sometimes there are uh, people who are really, really bad. They're really, really bad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send something like this to remind them, to wake them up, to test them. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can also, for the believer who is you know, doing his best or doing her best, if they pass away through something like this, they could be getting uh, more reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're considered to be a martyr. So the hadith the Prophet ﷺ taught us that if a believer dies from something like this, from something like the corona or something similar to it, they're considered a martyr, which means they go to Jannah straight. It's like their life ends here, but the world is so small. So the life ends in a very small place and they go to a much, much better place. Does that make sense? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, allows this as an opportunity for people to be lifted higher and higher and for to be, people to be punished. Good people will be lifted and bad people will be punished. And that's the way that we look at it. And of course, there are many other things and many other wisdoms, uh, subhanAllah, why these things can happen. Yeah. Sometimes when these things happen, people wake up, people unite, people come together, people come together. Tamam? May Allah bless you and give you Jannah to Firdaus. Uh, like now, you see so many messages coming together. Let me give you a positive example. Before before this uh, before this uh, outbreak or pandemic, we weren't doing any online programming. I wasn't able to communicate with you via you know uh, Facebook or via Zoom, and now we're doing it. So sometimes bad things can happen, but they can have a lot of blessing in the long term, bringing people together, allowing people to think, to reflect, to unite, to do khair, and to inshallah care for other people as well. Tamam? Why would Allah make some Muslims poor? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives as a form of test and he takes as a form of test. Tamam? Like for example, I can give you hundred dollars and I can say, what are you gonna do with it? Or I can I can you know I can I can put you in a situation where you have very little money, so I can teach you how to you know uh, do well with what you have. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test us by giving and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test us by taking, yeah. And sometimes subhanAllah when we have very little we end up actually doing a lot more. We end up being humble, being kind, appreciating this. So there are many, many blessings that come from being poor. There are many other blessings and tests 
that come from both. Yeah. So we have to be grateful for what we have. And of course, remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't necessarily make us poor. You know, sometimes what happens is uh, the, the poverty is a result of what people do. You know, people take resources, they steal resources, they steal land, they hurt others. So sometimes it's these bad things that happen, they're not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does them, it's because we actually do for ourselves. We do it to each other. Right? Like for example, when someone steals your money and you end up becoming poor because of that, is it because you had that happen to you because of Allah? Or is it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us all free choice and when we come back to him, Allah is going to be asking us, what did we do with that free choice? You have free choice. Did you steal? You had free choice. Did you give? You had free choice. Did you worship? You had free choice. Did you turn away? So we all have to be held accountable. Sister Sadaf is asking if we can continue these sessions afterwards. Inshallah, we will continue these sessions, inshallah, bin Allah ta'ala. I heard there's an ayah in the Quran that warns us about a time that we're going through. Do you know what ayah that is? Wallahi, there are so many ayat in the Quran and so many hadith that the Prophet Muhammad sallam talks about. Uh, one ayah that comes to mind is actually, وَاتَّقُوا فِتِنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً Remember that there comes a time in which Allah can send something uh, towards you that will not just impact those who are very oppressive. It will impact everyone. So there are many ayat in the Quran that talk about this. And at the end of the day, we have to be optimistic. As long as they bring us back to Allah, we should be happy. We should be very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Barakallah feek Hassan. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah to Firdaus. We have three minutes. We have three minutes. Tayyib, let's see if we have any last questions, inshallah ta'ala. If you benefited from this halaqa, please like it, please comment, please share it. Uh, and share it with your friends and family, inshallah, that have children. Because we want to, inshallah, uh, benefit as many people as possible. Bidnillah ta'ala. Barakallah feekum. It was so nice looking at all of you today. Or not really looking, but seeing your comments today. And inshallah, soon we'll be look at, looking at you directly with, uh, inshallah ta'ala, uh, Zoom bidnillah ta'ala. I'll finish off with a quick dua. I ask Allah to bless you, to bless your families for you, to give you the best in dunya and the best in akhirah, to make you happy, to make you sincere, to make you tranquil, to give you knowledge that benefits you, to give you wisdom, to give you patience, to give you clarity, to allow you to be balanced between, uh, you know, uh, financial uh, needs and Islamic needs and, and religious needs and spiritual needs and to be a complete human being, Ya Rabbi Ameen. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah to Fadaus, Ya Rabbi Ameen. This happens every Tuesday and Thursday at 5 p.m., let me know inshallah if you're able to join. See you next time. Jazakumullah khair. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad wa ala ashabi Muhammad. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka natubu alayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.